at 307. And we have a few bills on our agenda today. Our agenda shows Senate Putnam, 40, uh, Senate File 4234, uh, Senator Morrison, Bill Senate File 3427, followed by a sequence of my bills, and then Senator Morrison again on Senate File 3869. So I'd like to call to the testify table, Senator Putnam, Senator Putnam, welcome. On Senate File 4234, the environmental impact statement on large animal project requirement provision. So welcome, Senator Putnam, anytime you're ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to move a very brief amendment, which is a technical fix that puts the bill in its basic order. Uh, members, it, it changes one word uh, from commissioner to board because that's who's going to be doing the work. Okay, let the record show that we have quorum. Uh, we have one member online. Senator Lane is online. So, uh, Senator McHugh, Senator McHugh moves that uh, the A1 amendment to Senate File 4231 be adopted. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Can your motion prevail? Senator Putnam, to your bill as amended. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm glad to present Senate File 4234, which would require an environmental impact statement or an EIS for livestock projects of over 10,000 animal units. You know, I know we as legislators often thank a committee and a chair for the opportunity to have a conversation. I'd like to do that, but I'd also like to mean it uh, because that's what we're here for, is to have a conversation about something, a new development in Minnesota agriculture, and to discuss the consequences uh, of this development and to have a, a deep discussion about uh, really the state of Minnesota agriculture and Minnesota dairy. So I appreciate uh, Senator uh, her Chair her for, for ha giving us this opportunity to have this conversation. Um, 10,000 animal units is big. That's a lot of animals. Uh, talking about dairy, that's roughly 7,000 cows on a single site. Now that's a lot of cows, especially when the average size dairy in the state of Minnesota, according to the last Ag Census, was under 400 cows. And I've heard that under 10,000, the next biggest in Minnesota is around 4,000 animal units. So what we're talking about here today isn't just big, this is mega big. A kind of big that Minnesota has never seen before. And the plan is to get even bigger. Uh, just before the legislative session, we learned of a plan and project of more than 21,000 cows. Members, that's the capacity of the Excel Center just down the hill here. And I'd like to ask you to take a minute to imagine in your own head what you think a dairy farm looks like. And then take another moment and imagine the Excel Energy Center full of cows. This is a whole new thing, a difference in kind, not in degree. Now decades ago, in the late 1990s, this body debated our feedlot permitting rules. When we had that debate, many didn't anticipate this size of projects. Back then, as any farmer will tell you who was involved in those conversations, and I've talked to a number of them, 1,000 animal units, maybe 2,000 animal units, that was considered a very large operation. The rules we have right now weren't, and the people who made them weren't even able to conceive of an operation of 10,000 cows, let alone 20,000. Now, I've visited close to 60 farms over the past year, and I've heard the struggles of small and medium dairy farmers directly. Put simply, family dairies across our state are in crisis getting paid far below the cost of production. The latest Ag Census showed that between 2017 and 2022, Minnesota lost 40% of, uh, of our dairy farms. 40%. For the first time in Minnesota history, we have fewer than 2,000 dairy farms. All this occurred while the total number of cows increased. It's hard for our small farms to compete with what is in essence a factory. Now, that being said, we cannot say that mega dairies have caused the end of the small dairy farm. The correlation might be clear, but causation hasn't yet been proven. We cannot blame the mega dairy for putting folks out of business. And likewise, we cannot celebrate them for ushering in a new and better mode for our ag economy because we simply haven't asked the right questions yet. This bill would have us ask those questions. Be perfectly clear, this bill is not a moratorium. 
A moratorium, from my perspective, would be premature because we haven't adequately studied the phenomenon. This bill simply slows down the process to allow for formal inquiry. Given the novel scope and aggressive expansion of mega dairies, it would be irresponsible for us not to study their impact. Moreover, it would be disrespectful of greater Minnesota not to consider how these changes affect our small towns and main streets. We have to ask these questions, which is what this bill proposes. Now, obviously, not every farmer's organization agrees with me on this one. You can see that in your packets. But every dairy farmer I talk to is anxious and struggling. This requirement, this possibility to do an EIS is not new. The MPCA currently can require one and um, most likely will be compelled to do so in the future because if we don't act now, we face a future in which EISs will be forced on dairies through litigation. In this bill, we have an opportunity to be intentional and to keep the authority over these issues in the legislature and out of the courts. Now, whether we love them or hate them, mega dairies are having an impact on Minnesota. It's past time that we have a conversation that we think about the environmental, economic, cultural, and social questions raised by this drastic change in our dairy economy and in the everyday lives of dairy farmers across the state. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be glad to turn over to our testifiers. Thank you. Thank you, Sen uh, Senator Putnam, or Chair Putnam, and thank you for your acknowledgement about pre appreciating Chair, and you're Chair of our Ag Committee, so Chair to Chair, welcome, and the of the great work that you've done as well. So I want to call uh, Stu Laurie, Director of Government Relations of Minnesota Farmer Union. Thank you, Chair Her and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Stu Laurie. I'm the Government Relations Director of Minnesota Farmers Union, and I'm glad to share our support for Senator Putnam's bill, SF 4234, which would require an EIS for livestock projects over 10,000 uh, animal units. Uh, I'll start by saying this wasn't a position that our organization came to lightly. Y you'll see that this puts us in opposition to some folks who we usually agree with and oftentimes agree with at the Capitol, um, and it comes not just out of our grassroots policy development process, but, but also a very extensive discussion about this bill uh, with our full board of directors when they met last in, 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 in February. Um, you'll see in the letters of opposition talk about economic development, and I want to be clear that this is something that our organization weighs heavily. We care about rural economic development. People belong to Minnesota Farmers Union uh, because they care about rural economic uh, vitality. That said, I think our, our members have a, a different vision of what that economic development looks like. I think we feel like that development would be better, more spread out, more distributed, um, with more farmers uh, earning income off of, off of their, 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 their farm labor and, and making our farm economy more resilient. But that, that's clearly not the reality. Uh, as Chair Putnam uh, highlighted, our dairy industry is rapidly consolidating from 2017 to 2022 to repeat the state that he, the stat that he cited, we lost 40% of our dairies and we didn't lose uh, any cows. Those are being consolidated on larger operations. And so for our organization, we're looking at that and have an interest in making sure that our, our permitting processes are, are, are keeping up. Um, when our full board met, they had a, a couple specific concerns that I think are worth highlighting generally. First, um, the availability of, of water. Um, Livestock projects take a lot of water. They take that, they, they make that draw uh, year round and we wanna make sure that these projects can operate sustainably and won't have an adverse impact on our shared resource or area farms. Um, I, I don't hear from our membership concerns about the day-to-day -day operations of uh, these facilities, but they do wonder about what about the, the, the unexpected. Um, if we have an emergent animal disease at one of these uh, sites, uh, a natural disaster, um, a, a human illness that affects uh, the workforce, uh, those effects on our community are compounded when we have that many livestock consolidated in one place. And, and, and finally, I'll just highlight the social and economic effects, which I alluded to in the start of my statement um, in which an EIS more fully contemplates. So uh, we believe this is a timely discussion. We're committed um, to being a constructive partner in it, and we thank uh, Chair Putnam for bringing this forward and Chair Her for hearing this bill. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go to the testifier first, unless any members have um, a burning question. I, I, I suppose due to because uh, we don't have uh, it's just a small pool of testifier. You know, I'm open for 
any heartburning question that you may pose when uh, testify come uh, present. So uh, if not, I'll just move on to uh, Daryl Mo Mosel uh, from Land Storage Project board member. So welcome and state your name for the record. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is Daryl Mosel. Uh, I farm in uh, Stibley County, just southwest of here, a couple hours. Uh, I have a small dairy, about 100, uh, 100 dairy cows with all the young stock and rice, uh, livestock and crops with my farm. So I'm getting close to retirement. Uh, hopefully I have some sons gonna take over shortly. Um, Currently, I serve on the Land Stewardship Project Board of Directors and the Animal Agriculture Steering Committee. Right now, as you know, Minnesota is losing small and mid-sized dairy farms at an alarming rate. Uh, I, I really can't even express that in, in enough depth. Uh, in Sibley County, I think we're down to you know roughly eight farms left. And when I started there 45 years ago, we had close to 300 farms. And so we're, we're really losing dairy farms at an alarming rate. And, um, there is little doubt that dairy farming represents a significant economic boost to our community. Uh, dairy farms draw on a number of services, nutritionists, veterinarians, feed mills, milk hauling services, hoof trimmers, and, and the like. According to the University of Wisconsin, the average dairy cow in that state can generate $34,000 a year in economic activity, which is then circulated back into our communities through local schools. However, more cows do not necessarily equate to more economic activity. The local economic value of milk produced on one mega dairy is not the same as if it was produced on several small and medium sized operations. Uh, milking 4,000 cows on 25 different farms spreads out the economic benefits much more than having all those animals concentrated in one operation. Can we make up for all those lost dairy farms by simply replacing them with cows concentrated on a handful of dairies? If your goal is to produce the same amount of milk, maybe. But if we want to produce a healthier community overall, the answer is no. Those 25 families produce tax dollars to rural communities, participating in our schools, working in our hospitals and nursing homes. With uh, 25 farms on 4,000 cows, you'd be looking at about 160 to 200 dairy cows, which is a pretty good sized dairy for, for our state. I know with my farm right now with 100 cows, I have close to four people working there, and and um, you know it, it provides a good living to a number of families in my area, and we use all of our feeds from our farms, uh, from the farm land that we grow on, and uh, it's a good system. Um, LSP, LSP supports Senate File 4234 because it can take a small step toward economic justice for small and mid-sized dairy farms. However, we implore you to lower the threshold from 10,000 animal units down to 5,000. As you heard from the previous testimony, that's a very large dairy farm. And uh, you know, I was just reading in the, in the Star Tribune not too long ago that the city of Mexico, uh, Mexico City with 22 million people is, is about to run out of water possibly down the road. And you know, the wells in our area, I don't think could withstand that type of, a, of an animal population in one spot. And I'd be very concerned if I was you know, living around one of these farms about the depletion of an aquifer. I guess thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Moso. Any questions from members? Okay. All right, so we'll move on to the next testifier. Um, Pardon me if I mispronounce your, your name, Lucas uh, Jorstom. Lucas Jorstom. Um, and correct me if I pronounce it incorrectly. So welcome. Pretty good. Uh, thank you. We'll go with Chair Her. So Jays, they throw a lot of people off. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Chair Her and committee members. My name is Lucas Shostrom. I serve as Executive Director of the Minnesota Milk Producers Association. Uh, we serve all sizes of dairy farms. Uh, I want to note that after the packets were complete, um, the, the Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association, Midwest Council on Agriculture, and several more farms, I believe, submitted letters uh, to the committee administrator. 
But I'm also a dairy farmer, hold a bachelor's and master's degree in dairy science, did my graduate research on grazing dairy cattle, and previously worked as an editor at two national dairy farm magazines. And so through these experiences, I have visited dairy farms in 44 states of all types and sizes, including farms much larger than what we have in Minnesota today. And so my experience has been that farms with 10,000 animal units and more are very similar to farms with 9,999 animal units and less. They're put together by passionate families, as is the case of each one we have here in Minnesota. I will note that uh, cows have been steady here for about 10 years at about 450,000 cows in Minnesota, and we're down about 1.1% from this year to last. And all that is is to say, I don't, I don't believe we can do a good job of correlating uh, farm numbers and, and cow numbers. Uh, South Dakota to our west is growing both of those numbers, and I think the bigger reason is wide open geographic spaces. I lived in Vermont for two years, and there are not wide open geographic spaces, and housing development is their biggest threat to cow numbers and farm numbers. So I just, I just want to, uh, wanted to add that. Environmentally, uh, these farms are held to a very high standard. Their environmental assessment worksheets can be hundreds of pages long, and the permits they must follow for the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System has over 20 pages of rules in pretty small type print. Uh, through the process of building each farm, there are multiple comment periods and opportunities for local and statewide input. We had 1.4 million dairy cows in Minnesota in 1940. That number kept dropping until we began building farms with over 1,000 animal units in about 1995 and has stayed constant at that uh, 450,000 cow level for the past 20 years. Socially, I think what's unique about the dairy industry is, is we have discussions like this as we own much of our own processing. In Minnesota, probably about 90% of the milk goes to cooperatives. That means farmer-owned cooperatives are sitting around the table and deciding, should we accept milk from this new farm or not? Should we accept milk from this farm that wants to switch creameries or not? These discussions happen every day uh, through the farmer-owned boards and staff. And at the scale mentioned in this bill, you are not just putting up a farm and hoping that the milk truck shows up. Those conversations are happening years in advance with the processor that you are trying to solicit to pick up your milk. And so there's no surprises in that regard. Uh, financially, I know some are concerned about what these farms do to milk prices and the local basis. The last farm in Minnesota of this size was built in mid-2021. We experienced our best year of profitability probably in history in 2022. Uh, these farms cannot be pointed at as a cause for great or low prices. Uh, we're in a worldwide market, and like other commodities, when there's too much milk, prices drop. When there's too little milk, prices spike quickly. This bill would not slow down worldwide, U.S., or even upper Midwest production of milk. Your committee should vote against this bill because you can ensure that this size company has to follow all the rules and regulations of the state of Minnesota. Vot voting for this bill with our processing growth in the next five years that's expected will literally cause milk to flood in from other states from this exact size of farm. Dairy farming is difficult. That's why when our cooperatives and processors survey their dairy farmer patrons, they often learn that many of them are not planning to grow. So they instead begin conversations with families they know are interested in doing so. Today's modern plants will require about 77,000 cows based on 5 million pounds of milk per day. I cannot tell you what size and type of farm the economics of the future dairy market will need, but as the letters provided describe and the phone calls I received over the weekend show, there are a number of dairy farms who are looking to be at this level. Some of them already have these size operations spread out onto multiple sites and want to consolidate for their own economics. Um, others want to expand into Minnesota because they're being pushed out of states like Texas, Idaho, and California. Thank you, Chair Her. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Georgetown. Any questions? Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Herr. Um, maybe a statement or a question, I guess. So I worked at a dairy farm. We milked like 45 to 50 head of brown Swiss, so that have a higher, mac higher milk fat content. So that's maybe something, you know, we're going to have these big farms because there's competition for it. So then small farmers don't have to disappear. They could change the type of cows they have because then it's more profitable that way and then we can keep them around. So, Good comment. Yeah. Can you respond to that? Uh, yeah, Chair Hurst, Senator Westenberg, I, I think that's exactly what I've been talking about as I talk to the media. Farmers are specializing. Those that want to go forward are specializing in something. Uh, there are farms that are looking at creating their farm as, yes, we're going to milk cows, but we're going to be a 
dry cow facility for those cows in the maternity ward. Uh, yes, we're milking cows, but we're going to be a calf facility, and, and we're going to focus on calf raising for area farms. So I think whether it's components or genetics or some certain age of animal, that's what our farms are doing who are trying to stay innovative and be here. It's, it's difficult. I, I don't want to sugarcoat it, but I think to your point, uh, doing something special is, is what farms are doing to carry on to the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joestrom. Call next to the testifying table is uh, oh, Mr. Co Tony Kilas, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Tony Quillis, and I'm the oh. Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank you for the opportunity to make a couple of brief comments on Senate File 4234, and I have to start out by saying, Mr. Chairman, I'd really like to thank Senator Putman because he has been, um, had a great open-door policy, and is, we've had some good constructive conversations about my concerns on this, and so I wanted to thank him for that, for being able to have the conversations that we have had. But uh, Mr. Chairman and members, you've already heard from Mr. Jubstrom that uh, Minnesota already has a robust and rigorous process in place for environmental review of animal feedlots. And depending on the size and the location of the uh, project, you could have township, county, state, and federal oversight. Additionally, the Pollution Control Agency and the EQB are currently considering climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, and mitigation practices in the feedlot environmental assessment worksheet. As a matter of fact, the public notice came out today. The Environmental Review Implementation Subcommittee is going to look at these in expansion of that EAW feedlot next Wednesday. Another concern is that uh, if we add time and cost and uncertainty to the process, it's going to impact decisions on whether people either locate or expand here in the state of Minnesota. And the worry is that we lose economic development projects that we need to keep in this state to remain, remain competitive in the national and international economy. And these projects also have tremendous benefits that occur through these uh, partnerships with local farmers and the local economy. So Mr. Chairman, to wrap up, the dairy industry is at a crossroads right now and we need to encourage the industry to grow and develop here in Minnesota so we can foster economic development and create jobs here in Minnesota. Thank you very much for the time, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Thank you. Any comments from members? I'll call the next testifier, uh, Mr. Lauren Do Dollars. And welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair Her and members of the committee. My name is Lauren Dower, and I'm the Public Policy Specialist for the Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation. On behalf of our 30,000 farmer and rancher members, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in opposition to Senate File 4234, legislation that would require an environmental impact statement for livestock projects, over 10,000 uh, animal units. As evidenced by the consistent reporting they do with current regulatory framework, Farm Bureau members of every size and style uh, take their role as environmental stewards seriously. The existing framework, we believe, addresses the environmental concerns of larger farms. Currently, the MPCA commissioner can determine whether a formal environmental impact statement is necessary after reviewing uh, submitted environmental assessment worksheets. All farms that wish to expand over 1,000 animal units uh, are required to fill out this worksheet. Setting a mandatory environmental impact statement precedent for specific farm sizes would deter future uh, growth of family farms, which uh, look to expansion to help multiple generations in agriculture. We recognize the concerns of large farms on the environment, and we believe in the value of competition in the marketplace, the economic impact of growth and opportunity these farms bring to local communities uh, cannot be understated. Uh, requiring an additional assessment to an already robust re regulatory framework can be hurtful, uh, not just to farms who could possibly expand the size proposed in the bill today, but also to smaller operations around them. 
We are concerned with the un unintended consequences of the legislation before you today, but are willing to continue conversations with the bill author to find ways to improve, in improve the environmental review process. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Dower. Any members in the audience would like to testify pro or against this uh, bill? Mr. Chair, um, uh, sir, I, didn't I, see the, I didn't see the uh, PCA on the list, and being that we're giving them more control, I think it'd be appropriate to hear from the PCA if they're in the room. Is the PCA and PCA in the room? Please come forward. Welcome, and state your name for the record before your presentation. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'm Dana Vanderbosch. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Water Policy and Agriculture here at the MPCA. I'm happy to answer what questions I can. Uh, and Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Catherine Neuschler. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Quality Board. So we are the board that oversees the environmental review rules. Um, and I thought there might be questions about that too. So also happy to answer them. Okay. Going back to Senator Eichhorn, do you have any questions? Yeah, well, thank, for thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess the first thing I will say is I know that Minnesota, the, the review and feedlot permitting are already one of the most stringent and robust in the nation. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around why we need to expand this control even further. If you can, with help with this, what, what's the need for this? I'm trying to understand. It doesn't seem like there's that many facilities that really fall into this. Um, so Senator Putnam, can you, can you answer like how many, how many farms this is going to affect and then for the PCA, why, why do we need this right now? Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Eichhorn for the question. Uh, my understanding is we've got about nine uh, dairies that are 10,000 cattle or, or more, uh, animal units or more in the state of Minnesota. Um, and that they are all affiliated with the same uh, larger corporation that runs all of them. And I, I'd go back to my opening comments. And I, I actually should have clarified something that I should have said in my opening comments. And that I've got nothing against that particular corporation that's doing this. I've visited their uh, factories, and I think they're doing a great job of doing what they're doing. But it still doesn't really explain or help us appreciate um, the, the fundamental change that's happening in rural Minnesota right now when it comes to consolidation of agricultural resources. Uh, that's a question that we need to ask. It's something we need to think about. And as I tried to, to document earlier, this isn't just a larger dairy farm. It's an entirely different type of operation. Uh, this isn't just... Uh, you know, uh, like I said earlier, probably like 4,000 animal units is the next biggest farm, dairy farm in the state of Minnesota. The difference between that and 21,000 is enough to give us pause and think about it. And that's really all I'm asking to do. I'm not asking for punishment. Uh, I'm not asking for restriction. I'm asking us to slow down and think about it. That's all. So that's my rationale, Senator Eichhorn. Mr. Chair, a few more. Go on. Right, I understand the, the, the want to slow down and... Uh, might not feel like punishment, but I can tell you those in the, the mining industry understand how it is used as punishment, uh, the regulatory process. So that's what gives me pause, that why this bill gives me pause, because I've seen how agencies have been weaponized against industries we don't like at any given time, and I fear that the dairy industry is falling into that same category, because I think and, and there's... A lot, a lot of things people worry about with uh, what cows give off, and I, I guess I understand why there's some consternation from folks on your side that, that would worry about that. Um, has the MPCA, do you guys have uh, recommendations for different proposals? Have you talked to other groups? Um, I thought there was already some work done in this category and that you guys were possibly working on something. Can you help me through that? Ms. Vanderbilt or Ms. Nusher? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Eichhorn, yeah, it is true. You know, as, as you know, we currently do not have any threshold for in, a mandatory EIS for feedlots. And so in the absence of that, as we've seen these larger um, feedlot proposals coming forward, um, we have been considering how we're going to how we're going to consider the environmental impacts from these larger operations. Uh, we have updated the feedlot EAW form. I believe that um, those 
that proposed form is still moving through the EQB process for approval. So that's one thing that we've done. We also have, um, are intending on issuing individual permits for feedlots that are over 10,000 animal units moving forward. And um, the difference between our, the general permit and the individual permit, um, most of our feedlots are covered by general permits where all of the permit requirements are the same from feedlot to feedlot. But with an individual permit, that gives us the ability to incorporate kind of customized permit requirements um, for that operation. So we think that that will allow us to for example, put in uh, additional requirements if the feedlot in question is going to be placed in a, a very sensitive area um, or a place where there's, uh, you know, karst topography or things like that. So those are some of the um, some of the changes that we're planning on making that I think you're referring to. Okay. Senator Cohen. And I'll just I'll just make a few comments. I mean, I I've got probably half a dozen more questions, but I know. What, what is first of all? I, I, one more question for you, Mr. Chair. What's the path? Is this a layover, or is it going somewhere? Uh, it will leave this committee to the state and local government. Does it go to the Agriculture Committee at all? Uh, I think Senator Putnam will have answer for, for that. Mr. Chair, that's yet to be uh, Senator Eichhorn. That's yet to be decided. Okay. I think it would probably be appropriate for that committee to hear this as well, Mr. Chair. I will say I. I, I I do worry that, that this bill could limit livestock investments in, in Minnesota and send it to other states. Like we've seen in other areas where they look at Minnesota and say, we're not going to deal with the regulatory environment. It's way too burdensome. I know we need to strike a balance, and I don't, I don't know if this does it. It's going to give industry more pause when they're thinking about Minnesota, when they can think about doing it much easier in one of our neighboring states, when we'd love to see those jobs here those farms continue to be here. And then outside of that, all the, the smaller operations that do feed those larger farms also benefit. So I, th I think we're doing a disservice by putting more regulation in. And I think that kind of like we heard the all, all of the above approach to other things in this committee before, I think the dairy industry needs farms of all sizes to support our milk processing industry because it is a, a, a worldwide market. And I, I do think that... Um, this is prob probably not the right thing at the right time. I'd like to see maybe some more discussion from the groups. It'd, it'd be great if, I know, like, if you had the Farm Bureau folks in the same room as the Farmers Union folks, and obviously there's, there's some disagreement even amongst farmers whether or not this is a good idea. So I, I do think more discussion should be had, and I, I, I'm really uncomfortable based on what we've seen, at least on industries in my district and Senator Hostchild's district, what this can mean and how it can be weaponized to shut stuff down when they don't like something they're doing or even their politics or whatever. So this gives me great pause. So I, it's not something I can support today, but I think it should probably be continued to be worked on and, and uh, maybe a larger discussion at a later point. But I, I'm glad you gave us the opportunity to have the discussion today. I just don't think we're, we're quite there yet on this. Uh, Senator Putin. Senator, may, may I respond to Senator Eichhorn's uh, uh, excellent points? I just want to say I appreciate you what you're saying. I totally understand it. Uh, and there is a concern that, that regulation can restrict commerce uh, and that it can be weaponized. Totally understand that. Um, but I would draw a distinction between your analogy to mining and to dairy farms because we don't have mom and pop miners. Um, you know, this, this is, in my perspective, an effort to, to see that we can um, not necessarily save, but how we can help greater Minnesotan vitality. Uh, and to understand the impact on Greater Minnesota's vitality. You know, it's, I am the Ag Chair, but if you look at the entire title of my committee, it's Agriculture Broadband and Rural Development. This is key to that concern. And I don't see this closing anything down. It's giving us an opportunity to talk about it. The farms that still exist, will still exist, gives us an opportunity to talk about the consequences on those small farms. So thank you again for your point, Senator Icon. I, I agree with you in a number of ways. Thank you, Senator Putton. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I got some questions for the senator, but before we lose the MPCA, I'd like the uh, explanation, if I could. Um, in the bill, you talk about the good, good cause exception. And can you explain that to me and why this is needed? Explain it to the, the committee and why you think it's needed. Ms. Nooster. Yes, I can take that one. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Green, um, I, want to, I want to be clear that was put in the bill. We didn't, that wasn't requested. Um, we, we have not um, 
we have talked with the senator about the bill, but did not request the bill. Um, good cause exemption is a rulemaking process that is allowed to be used when rules need to be changed and the agency that is changing the rules doesn't need to do any interpretation of law. And so in this case, with the bill making the direction very clear about changing the rules to set a threshold for the EIS category, um, and we have pretty, a pretty standard um, rule language for the way thresholds are written in our rules. I think that was the intent behind the good cause exempt, that it could be done very quickly because it is um, putting into effect the intent of the legislature. So I agree. Mr. Chair, uh, but as I understand it, this would uh, uh, forego any uh, ordinary notice that, that might go out, um, any comment procedures. So there would be no maybe maybe public meetings discussed uh, during this. It just would be the authority to move forward without uh, public information being out there. Is that correct? Ms. Snowshire. Sure. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, it is a, a considerably shorter process. Um, no, no, I, I can't give you the exact details, but yes, there's, there's no requirement to do a statement of need and reasonableness, and there's considerably... I think you're correct that there's no comment period. There is some notice, but it is it is a considerably smaller process than a full rulemaking. Mr. Chair, um, do you really think that that's necessary? We have a, a pretty erroneous process right now. And uh, we uh, when it comes to permitting, and now to, uh, to forego uh, any public comment period, it seems to me that now our, our, our farmers, in, in, in this case, constantly fight with, with agencies. I mean, it's a battle. And they're, they're actually f worried when you come to the door. And now it looks like you're taking away any, time, any, uh, any comments they might be able to have. Uh, you're just going to move forward with this process without, uh, without the, uh, the due process, I guess, for lack of a better word. I'm not sure why that's needed. Um, and, and the... The rest of the bill, too, I've got some questions on. Uh, Senator, Senator Putman, uh, it was just stated that uh, the agency didn't ask for this bill. Uh, who asked for the bill? Senator Putman. Uh, Senator Her, uh, excuse me. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Her, mm -hmm. Senator Green. Um, it's something I heard about from almost every farmer I visited with over the last year. Uh, the concern about the state of Minnesota dairy uh, is ubiquitous among the ag community. This bill was drafted in consultation with Farmers Union, uh, and only Farmers Union, uh, but it comes from organically conversations with actual farmers. And I would add too, I'm not sure if we're uh, convoluting or, or we've confused two things together, but the EIS process is a deeply public process that requires public consultation. I'm not sure if you were talking about that or the exemption that was mentioned earlier. But the EIS process actually, and I'm, I appreciate your interest in community feedback on these issues because that's what the EIS would do. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just as a comment on that, I've, I've, uh, um, my experience with EQB is exactly the opposite, uh, but we'll, we can get into that another day. Uh, and you said you talked to farmers, uh, and I'd like to know which farmers you talked to, because uh, I've been around a little while. And uh, when I grew up, we actually had some dairy cows, very few, but I milked them by hand. And, uh, and at that time, we could sell bee milk. And so we milked it, we threw it into a cream can, hauled it up, and they made dried milk or cheese or whatever they made out of it. And regulations drove that out. Uh, we could no longer do that. And at that time, I could probably count five or six dairy farms that within five miles of my house, almost everybody had a few dairy cows, you know, between 20 and, and 100 dairy cows. And why they stopped was they couldn't keep up with the new regulations coming at them. Uh, and that was even before the agencies got as powerful as they are. And, and so I, I would submit to you that the reason that we have big dairy is the same reason that we have big other agriculture. That the small farmers can't compete anymore and still make a living. And you know, you've gotta, you put, uh, have to put, at the time, probably between $50,000 and $100, which maybe in our dollars today doesn't seem like much, but back in the 70s, that was more than they could do. And so to, to allow us to continue to uh, have egg products 
that were reasonably priced so people could afford to buy them, such as milk, uh, wheat, corn. The farmers were forced to get bigger and, and try to get bigger yields. Uh, and to give you an example of what some of the dairy farmers are doing now, um, when, I, when I was milking cows, one of our best cows would give us uh, six gallons of milk a day. I don't even think that competes anymore with what they have. Uh, and these, these places are super clean. Uh, they don't go into stanchions and stand. They, they walk through, uh, a machine comes on and milks them, and then they move on. Because without automation, they wouldn't survive. And so I think that to, uh, to hinder these is not in any way going to bring back small dairy. I wish it would. I loved the small farm. But they can't make a living. They just can't. Not in this society. And not in, in, the, in the way we do things now. And so I think you said it wasn't a moratorium, but I really believe that that's what it's going to end up being. And so uh, I've said as much as I need to say there, but I will ask, um, because you don't think this is going to have to go to ag or maybe not go to ag, have you consulted with the Department of Agriculture on this? Senator Putnam. Uh, thank you, Chair Herr. Thank you, Senator Green. Yes, I have. Okay, and what was their comp? Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Senator and, Green. And what, what were their... Uh, Concerns or if any on the bill? Uh, uh, Chair Herr, uh, Senator Green, uh, no, ex no reservations were expressed to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chair. And I, I uh, didn't probably get the same as that, but we can maybe talk about that online. I, I do think that this should slow down. Uh, when, when the agency hasn't asked for it, um, there's no real path forward except for to stop what's there uh, without looking ahead as to, you know, what your plan for the future is even going to be attainable. So, can't really support the bill. Thank you. On Senator McEwen. Thank you. Um, it, so, we're hearing a bill that will make um, it a, an environmental impact statement a mandatory, so it's reliable. You know you're going to have to fill it out for a uh, construction or expansion of a large livestock facility with a capacity of 10,000 or more animal units. And it's evolved to talking about agency restrictions and work and small farmers versus large farmers. And it's so interesting. I know that I had heard you say that the one, uh, that there's one corporation uh, in Minnesota that owns dairies of this size. So I just, I just want us to take note that, that this is a bill that addresses that and now we're, we're talking waxing romantic about small dairy farms, which I think actually we are all very sympathetic to want to shore up and keep and make healthier. Um, in my mind, this bill actually cuts to how to help those smaller dairies. And um, I also think that there's a, an amount of absurdity in our debate, that if I went out and I ask my constituents when I talk to them and I say, hey, we heard a bill in the Environment Committee that would do this, and um, what do you think about that? Do you think that a, a dairy that was proposing to open with that many heads of, of uh, milking cows would would ha should have to do an environmental impact statement, and the answer would be, of course, that doesn't already exist. I I think that um, I agree that with one of our other supporters of the bill that you know I, I would love to see this lowered to five thousand. As I'm a co-author of the bill, I support the bill and I support um, what you're trying to do here, Senator Putnam. And I would just make sure that people understand. Sometimes the conversations that we have in Senate committees is so disconnected from where the people of the state of Minnesota are. Um, and we start talking about our agencies, we start talking about w whether we want to give the industry more pause. Yes, yes we do want to give the industry more pause. Absolutely we do. I do. Um, and we talk about weaponizing environmental laws. Well, my constituents feel that a lot of our agencies have been weaponizing um, the laws in the reverse, against us, not protecting our environment enough, not protecting our water enough in favor of corporate power. And we've seen that over the recent years. So um, I just, 
I, I want people to understand that the bill that you are presenting, that is the compromise, as far as I am concerned. That is definitely a compromise. And um, I would like to see it stronger, but I, I know that you are a man of compromise and a senator of compromise, and I respect that very much. So I, I, and I appreciate the discussion. I just um, wanted to give voice to um, the other perspective, which I think is, I know in my district is the majority perspective. Senator McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, <clears throat> I too wanted to bring it back to what this bill really is and what this bill is all about. And this bill is about uh, thousands, tens of thousands of animals um, that are excreting every day. And I'm wondering if you have any idea <clears throat> on a farm that has approximately 10,000 animals or, or cows, I mean, what is the animal waste? I mean, is there poundage? What, where, what do they do with all of that? Where does it go? How is it transported? And what is the effect on the community around those farms? I mean, I, I grew up in this little rural town surrounded by farms, and when they started spreading manure, man, you walked around with a clothespin on your nose. And it's, it gets worse and worse with the more that you have. So I, I don't know if you have this information, but you know, do we have an estimate of what, what this animal waste is and how much it weighs and what do we do with it? Senator Putin. Chair Her and uh, Senator Kunish, thank you for that question. Um, I, I want to admit that, it, I, I, and with, with some degree of pride, that I visited two of these facilities myself. Um, and they do what they do very well. Mm -hmm. I think they do what they do very, very well. But I'm just a dude. Like, I don't know uh, the environmental consequences of these things. That's why we need other folks to study it for us and to figure it out, mm -hmm. which is what this is intended to do. Um, um, I would defer. Perhaps no. No. Um, <laughs> all right. And just who has the poop on poop? I guess is the question. Who has the poop on it? <laughs> sorry, Green. Did you raise your hand? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, I think uh, we, we, could. we have a we have an answer on the uh, okay. the the waste question. Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Kunish, I, it's very easy, I think, if, uh, for us to run the calculation that you're talking about. I don't have that information right here, but I can tell you that um, for you know the, the dairies that we're talking about, um, they collect the manure and it routes to a manure lagoon um, where it's stored, and after a certain period of time, it's pumped out and it's used um, on application of agricultural fields, you know, as you were mentioning. And so the, um, the dairy owner may use some of that on their own fields, or they may sell it or have it transported off-site to be used on other people's fields. And so that's very common. And um, the uh, feedlot permits that we issue, you know, govern how that manure is applied, you know, to the agricultural lands. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, to the MPCA, uh, can you uh, require uh, economic impact statement or uh, EIS now? A com assistant Commissioner. Yes. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, if a facility is required to complete an EAW for a new or an expanded facility as a part of that EAW process, there's a decision to be made at the end of that process where we can, um, we can state that we think the EAW is insufficient and require the next step moving to an environmental impact statement. So that is a decision that the commissioner can make in those kinds of um, situations. We can also advise that a, you know, a a uh, business that is coming to us with a newer and expanded facility that's very large, let's say over 10,000 animal units, that they, we can advise that they voluntarily um, opt to undertake an environmental impact statement. So we have, um, you know, made, we have advised that in the past. So those are a couple of tools that we have at our disposal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so the answer is yes, you can require it now already. Uh, Senator Putman, uh, can you tell me how this uh, is going to spur a small dairy farm to start. Senator Putin. 
Uh, Chair Hurst and Green, thank you for that question. Uh, I'd like to sort of follow up on our friends from MPCA. As I said in my opening statements, obviously they can do that now. They can do the URI uh, as I said in my opening statement. Um, my partial concern here is that uh, as these facilities of this size continue to proliferate, there will be litigation to slow down and stop them and to require EISs. And so from my mind, it makes more efficient, makes more sense for the legislature to take its role uh, in requiring them ourselves. Because I can tell you in a heartbeat, if there's a 26,000 uh, cow dairy that's opening up, there's gonna be a lawsuit that will require that if our friends at PCA don't do it. Now I will tell you, it is your second question. Uh, do I know that this will save the small dairy? Which I think is the essence of your question. And no, I don't. I don't know that. I don't know. Uh, uh, if slowing down these large dairies is going to be some panacea for the small dairy. I, I can't say that that's true. I don't know it. Um, but I don't think anybody does. I can't tell you that one of the dairies that I visited, one of these large dairies I visited, um, visiting with the township supervisor who were very supportive of this facility being there, told me that uh, before that facility that was there in that county, they had 150 dairy farms. Now that the facility is there, they have fewer than 10. So I can't say that this is necessarily gonna help. But I can say it's gonna get us to think about it. And one other great thing about the EIS that's distinct from an EAW is it do, is significantly more rigorous in terms of its investment in public discussion. The EIS requires more public conversations about this than the EAW does. And the other thing that's important to me, and I'm assuming is important to you too, is it's not exclusively about the environment. It's about the cultural and economic impact of this new facility. So we'll be asking the exact same question that you just asked me that frankly I just don't know the answer to. Thank you, Senator Pan. Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I can't remember if I could ha ask you a question again. Um, I don't remember your name, sorry. There's a J in it. Yeah, Mr. J. Mr. <laughs> J. Jostrom. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a question to get at number of farms. Is it as, do some farmers come together as like if there's three farms, do they come together under one roof sometimes? And if that happens, do we now count that as one farm and no longer three farms? Does that make sense? Okay. Mr. Jostrom. Mr. Chair, Senator Westenberg. Uh, yeah, we track farm numbers in Minnesota by permits. So if that happens, you would track one, one permit. And so um, my job is to keep farms in business. I want more farms. I'm at a 50% fail rate ever since I've started, not going so hot. <laughs> Uh, and I would love to find answers to these questions that have been asked around the table. But to be clear, if we want to be at 100% of what we had last year, that means 100% of our farms need to find another generation who's going to take over. So I think the example you have happens often, cousins, brothers, uh, sister, brother, uh, father, daughter, whatever it might be. Uh, there might be more farmers uh, impacting the farm as they grow, but we only in numbers count it as one permit. So I think that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any earlier to say uh, any testify from members? Uh, no, from uh, from the audience. And uh, I think a member has already posed a question, so I want to reiterate that again to see anybody from the audience want to speak, speak in support of against. Good. Um, well, thank you, Senator Putnam, for bringing this bill forward and um, also appreciate you mentioning uh, the environmental impact statement as well and give us some broader knowledge, especially here in this environment committee. <laughs> so uh, now that uh, this bill is moving forward, I'd like to send a cue uh, to motion uh, this bill, Senate File 4234 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Senate State and Local Government Committee. All in favor say aye. aye. Okay, opposed? No. Okay, motion prevail. And thank you very much, Senator Putnam. Um, thank you for being here, Chair Putnam as well. And later on in this committee, we'll hear a bill due to our joint committee that we had early on this session. Thank so thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is, um, 
Sarah Morrison. Yes. Sarah Morrison, uh, Senate File 3427. Okay, yeah. Products, short storage program establishment to promote the recycling of boat wrap. Senator Morrison, do you have an, an amendment? Mr. Chair, I do. I have the A1 amendment. Okay. Uh, Senator Morrison had A1 amendment. Um, will Senator Morrison will move that the A1 amendment to Senate File 3427 be adopted. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion prevail. Senator Morrison, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Mr. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 3427 as amended. Uh, this is a bill that is the brainchild of a colleague in the other body who became quite alarmed at the volume of plastic waste we're generating from boat shrink wrap plastic in Minnesota. Minnesota has the most boats per capita of any U.S. state and is either has either the first or second most boats, uh, depending on who's counting, but it's well over 800,000. Many of these boats get shrink-wrapped in the winter to protect them from the elements. Based on surveys done in other states about the percent of boats that are shrink-wrapped and the average amount of shrink-wrap used per boat, which is about 15 to 40 pounds, it's likely that there's at least 6 million pounds of boat shrink-wrap used every year in Minnesota, and the vast majority of that goes into a landfill or an incinerator. But this plastic can be recycled. Uh, it's low-density polyethylene plastic, which is one of the most common plastic materials available and is also easily recycled into things like plastic lumber, construction sheeting, and garbage bags, and also back into boat shrink wrap. So this bill is a product stewardship bill that requires producers of shrink wrap to fund a product stewardship organization that collects and recycles the boat plastic. The best and most cost-effective time to think about how to recycle something is up front when you're creating the product. The program will be administered by MPCA and was modeled after the successful paint product stewardship program we have here in Minnesota. Shrink wrapping a boat costs around $400, and so we can have a frame of reference on cost. In Michigan, there's a company that collects and recycles boat shrink wrap for about $9 a boat. And with that, I will turn it over to my testifier, Ivana Stark, who is the State Director of Clean Water Action. Director Stark, welcome. Thank you, Chair Her and members of the committee. I'm Ivana Stark, State Director of Clean Water Action, and I'm here to represent 132,000 of our Minnesota members regarding issues that keep our water safe to drink, cook with, and play in. And I don't think I can adequately say how much I love my boat. I grew up poor with a disabled parent, and so having a boat was always the epitome of happiness. So it was a really big deal when we bought one a few years ago. To me and many Minnesotans, there is no better place than in the sun, covered in non-toxic sunscreen, on the water. But as a boat owner, I take this responsibility very seriously. And recently, our canvas cover ripped, and it was not cheap. We're talking thousands of dollars. And when my fiance suggested plastic wrap, that did not go very well for him, as you can imagine, in our household. Minnesota leads the nation in boats per capita with roughly 14,500 boats per 100,000 people. And the one-pager in your packet gives you a lot of stats. So let's focus on the fact that the moderate, there's a moderate estimate of 6.25 million pounds of shrink wrap a year that's used in Minnesota, and that ends up in landfills. Um, as you've heard, this bill creates a product stewardship system to responsibly mechanically recycle boat wrap. It's not chemical recycling, which is very important. And it creates jobs in Minnesota. It keeps toxic chemicals that are in plastic out of our landfills. There are tens of thousands of chemicals in plastic, and many have known negative health impacts. Many of these chemicals are yet to be studied, and we also know that plastic breaks down into microplastic and pollutes aquatic animals in water, which we then eat and drink. Growing evidence suggests microplastics can accumulate in the body and trigger inflammation, insulin resistance, and liver issues. 
As a boat owner, I'm excited to engage in a process that reduces waste and protects our water. The cost to boat owners is extremely low and well worth it when you consider the return on investment. For less than the cost of a large bottle of non-toxic sunscreen, one boat worth of plastic can be recycled. So I urge your support of Senate File 3427 and sincerely thank Senator Morrison for supporting our waterways through this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Albao. I'd like to call to testify as Ms. Rochelle Share. She is an, oh, Ms. Alan Rochelle. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Elon Rochelle Share, Special, Special Projects Manager with Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates represents lake home and cabin owners, anglers, marina and resort owners. Over 290 lake associations with about 58,000 members are contributing supporters of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers. We are speaking in support of Senate File 3427, the creation of a boat wrap stewardship program. We're here because our thousands of members know plastic pollution poses a threat to the health of our lands, waterways, and people. Our members know a boat wrap product stewardship program is a necessary ingredient of building a Minnesota that produces less plastic waste. Uh, like stated before, the technology to recycle boat wrap already exists in Minnesota, and we also know there have been similar boat wrap recycling programs implemented successfully in other states. We have all the pieces needed to implement this program, and it's a simple and direct step towards preventing the 6.25 million pounds of plastic waste generated each year. Thanks for your time in considering the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Rochelle Share. Any questions to the testifier or a question to Senator Morrison from members? Okay. Um, we are, are you done with all the testifiers and everybody? Yes, I think that's what we have on the list. All right, perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Icorn. Uh My understanding was, uh, if I remember right, 2023 was a long time ago. But I think, didn't we have a pilot where we did this and there was a a company around, I think the Rogers area maybe, that, that was collecting it. I think My Plast was the name of it. Do you remember that? Was there a pilot that we did? And can you just touch on that and how that went a little bit? Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Eichhorn. There was a pilot uh, done, and I don't have those results at the top, off the top of my head. I follow up. I, I think they might be discussing. Okay. They, they, maybe they have an answer. If not, I'll just continue. Did you have okay. a potential Anybody? answer or not? It, it, Senator Eichhorn, non specifically, it went well. Um, the name of it, you're right, it's my class. Um, and my understanding is they're pretty excited about this. Okay, so you have had an opportunity to chat with my class, mm -hmm. and they think they can handle a statewide program. I think they're the only ones right now that have mm -hmm. the capacity to actually do anything. Um, and so, I, Unlike Michigan, my understanding of the Michigan facility is it's more of a regional kind of program. I worry about our costs being higher than $9 a, a piece, considering that we might have hundreds of miles. You're talking about transporting something from you know, Grand Rapids down to, to Rogers could be more expensive possibly than what the program they have there is. The other question I have is um, how would this apply to like multi-use type boat covers that could still you know, be a plastic type material? They could still last between five and 10 years could potentially be more difficult to recycle. I mean, how would, are, are you talking only about the one-time use wraps or would these, you know, wraps that could be used multiple uses also be covered under the bill? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Eichhorn. This is just for the boat, the one-time use boat shrink wrap. Okay. Senator Eichhorn. I get, what, one of my biggest concerns, again, is, is the cost. Um, you know, when you're talking about $400, maybe an extra $10, $15, $20 doesn't seem like that much. But if you're getting a smaller boat wrapped, I mean, that can be cost prohibitive for a lot of folks that are already stretched thin. So that's where I really struggle with this. I think it would be, I think it's, it's good to recycle where we can. Um, concerned about the cost, it would be great if we could find a recycling opportunity that wasn't just in one location, if there was other spots to be able to actually, if there was something in Duluth, there's something in Brainerd, or just other locations throughout the state that could maybe help write the cost down. Because um, we know that even though the producers are going to be 
paying the fee ultimately the consumers then going to end up paying it which is what my ultimate concern is in a, in a scenario where we're already stretched pretty thin so support the concept but I don't necessarily support the bill I don't know if it's quite where it could be where where I could support it yet just because I'm, I'm really concerned about the fees and, and how it will be implemented but um, definitely a good discussion to have so thank you Senator thank you Mr. Chair and thank you Senator Eichhorn um, I, the, just the sheer volume of the amount of plastic that we're producing every year is is the big concern. This is low hanging fruit for us to have them go that go into landfills and incinerators um, harms our water and therefore our health. Mr. Chair, is my plastic? I mean, are, are they you're saying there's a massive amount? I mean, are they actually? I, I don't know. If anyone from my plastic is here, it'd be great to hear from them. But I mean, are, can they handle that kind of volume? Or are they actually set up to? take everything we have as a state? It's my plastic, right? I don't uh, Mr. Think Chair, Senator, Senator, Senator Eichhorn, my understanding is yes, and who knows, this could create an opportunity for a new business to crop up too, but my understanding is yes, they're ready. Okay, thank you for the answer. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, did you say that people are incinerating plastic? No, I didn't. I guess I misunderstood what I heard, I Ms. heard that. Ms. Avana? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Wiesbrink, Um No, it's a mechanical form of exfoliation that turns the plastic back into a resin and the resin back into a plastic. It is not a chemical form of recycling, which is important to note. So it's a mechanical form of recycling. So, so, Senator Wiesenberg has, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. No, I was talking about Senator Morrison. I think she was talking about garbage, and she said we can't incinerate plastic because that's bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I know when people throw things, I'm saying we should recycle, as Justin Eichhorn, Senator Eichhorn said, I'm sorry. Um, it's good to recycle, but um, I don't know that a lot of this waste is getting incinerated. Do you, can, do you have those numbers? Can you tell me how much plastic boat waste is getting incinerated? Uh -huh, Senator Morrison. Mr. Chair, Senator Wiesenberg, no, I can't give you exact numbers, but if we're putting six million pounds into landfills, some of it is going to get incinerated too, which is not good for any of us. Right, but thank you, thank you, Senator thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to see something. If you can't just say something, you have to prove it. Um, and I, but I guess I have another question. Have we talked to like uh, I know the people that wrap the boats? Have we talked to them to see where they're going to store this and who's going to come to collect it? Have you talked to these agencies in Greater Minnesota, Ms. Savana? Senate uh, Chair and Senator, um, that's part of the product stewardship role is that they create that plan. So there are three facilities that can handle this process, and this program will set up that process for collection. Where are these locations situated across the state to make sure that we're not running into everyone having to personally travel to Rogers, for example? So that's a part of what this organization is going to be tasked with. Thank you for that answer. Um, and Mr. Chair, I think, you know, Senator as, as uh, Senator Acorn stated, I think it's, it's a good bill. I just think it, there needs to be work done so we can see where those things are, just as this is a place. But we don't know where that place is, and we don't know who's going to do it, right? So I think we need to have, there needs to be more work before we just say this is going to happen. Um, it, it, it seems like it's too loose yet. It needs to come together more. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Senator Morrison, any last uh, comment before we move the bill? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I would just say that we go through millions of pounds of this boat shrink wrap in Minnesota uh, every year, the vast majority of which, as I said, ends up in landfills and some in incinerators. But it's recyclable, so there's a huge opportunity here. I, this is low-hanging fruit for us. Um, we're up, and this is an intelligent and cost-effective way to do it, so I ask for your support. Um, so I would move that it uh, be passed to judiciary. Okay. Well, Senator Morrison... Motion um, move that uh, Senate File 3427 as amended to be recommended and passed and be referred to the Senate Judiciary Committee. So, all in favor of Senator Morrison, fa uh, motion say aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Okay, motion prevail.
Congratulations, Sam Morrison. Thank you. So I will turn the gavel to Senator McCune as I will deliver a, a sequence of uh, MPCA agency bill. Welcome to your committee, Chair Her. Um, and I believe we're starting now with um, Senate uh, 4492. 4492. Okay. To your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as I mentioned earlier to uh, Senator Putnam, this is a joint proposal from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and also Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Earlier this year, the Environment and Agriculture Committees met in a joint hearing with presentation from the agency on nitrate pollution in sensitive area, specifically southeastern Minnesota. This bill represents one of the many small ways the agency are working together to close gaps and protect groundwater in the most vulnerable regions. This proposal aligns the manure application, which is managed by MPCA, with the commercial fertilizer application, which is managed by MDA. This is a common sense bill to ensure nitrate has been managed consistently in sensitive areas which already have higher nitrate contamination issue. So um, I have here uh, to testify and support its Assistant Commissioner Dana uh, Vendor Bosch uh, from, and also there, um, folks from the Department of Agriculture also here if needed to testify. Thank you, Chair Her. Uh, welcome to the Senate Environment Committee. If you would please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name again is Dana Vanderbosch, uh, Assistant Commissioner for Water Policy and Agriculture at the MPCA. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of Senate File 4492. This proposal really seeks to align um, guidance between the groundwater protection rule that the Minnesota Department of Agriculture oversees and the feedlot statutes that the MPCA implements to ensure a, co a coordinated approach between the MDA and MPCA for total nitrogen management in areas that are most vulnerable to groundwater contamination. The groundwater protection rule relates to the drinking water supply management areas, they're sometimes called DWISMAs, uh, which have elevated nitrate and where the drinking water supply uh, area is threatened. And the goal here is really to take action to reduce nitrate in groundwater before a public well uh, exceeds the health standard for nitrate. In drinking water supply management areas where nitrate is high, the uh, MDA evaluates the total nitrogen rate, including both commercial fertilizer and manure that is applied to a field, um, that is applied to cropland within the drinking water supply management boundary. And they publish and promote a nitrogen fertilizer rate. They do this work in concert with an advisory team comprised of farmers located within the drinking water supply management area. Now under current rules, fields receiving manure within the drinking water supply management area may have two recommended total nitrogen rates. The one established in the Department of Agriculture's published nitrogen rate for the drinking water supply management area and the one established in their uh, manure management plan. So what this uh, policy proposal is really seeking to do is to really align the two nitrogen rate recommendations ensuring protection of groundwater. Farmers applying manure within this area would need to use the Department of Agriculture's published nitrogen rate for the drinking water supply management area, and then they would submit their uh, manure management plan to MPCA for approval. Our approval ensures that the farmer understands the Department of Ag is working within that particular area to protect drinking water and is planning on applying the manure nitrogen uh, at the rates that the MDA is setting for the drinking water supply management area. 
This approach would apply to about a half a percent to 1% of the cropland in Minnesota, so it's a very small area relative to all of the cropland. And this is really a very targeted approach and it's really directly related to the need to actively work with landowners within these drinking water supply management areas uh, with high nitrate levels to reduce pollutants and safeguard protection of people's drinking water. We brought this proposal to agricultural stakeholders and environmental advocates for discussion, and we all believe that the goal of aligning these two programs uh, would both avoid confusion for the farmer and also assure groundwater protection, and it's something that we can all agree to, and that this proposal offers a reasonable and focused approach to help reduce nitrate in these very sensitive areas. We do have a representative, uh, as Chair Herr mentioned, um, from the Department of Agriculture here today, and so together uh, she and I are happy to answer any questions that you might have about the proposal. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Chair Herr, we also had somebody else, Daryl um, Mosel, who had signed up on this bill to testify. Is that correct, or is that? I'll defer that to my... Uh, Committee, Looks I'm like right. Oh, he's here. Okay. Yep. Oh. Welcome. Did you have um, some testimony to submit on this um, Senate file? Uh, this is on 4492. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, if yeah. you'd please introduce yourself for the record and right. proceed with your testimony. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair uh, and members. Um, uh, thank you for having me here again today. For the record, my name is Daryl Mosel, and I'm a Sibley County farmer, and I serve on the Land Stewardship Project uh, Board of Directors and Animal Agriculture Steering Committee. Uh, when I served in the legislature decades ago, I was deeply involved in the passage of the Groundwater Protection Act. As a farmer in rural Minnesota, clean water is deeply important to me. Animal agriculture with the right systems and policies can be a solution to the compounding challenges our communities face. Unsafe drinking water, a changing climate, soil erosion and loss of soil organic matter and more. While Land Stewardship Project uh, appreciates this bill and supports it, requiring manure management plans in level two drinking water supply management areas alone will not make a significant difference in addressing water quality issues across the state, such as nitrate crisis in, in so southeast Minnesota. Uh, we must go further to reduce over application of nitrogen fertilizer and manure, including passage of Senator Kunich's Senate file 4581, and significantly expanding the adoption of soil health practices that reduce the need for inputs. Uh, we hope you will pass Senate file 4492 in conjunction with taking additional actions to ensure all Minnesotans can drink safely out of their tap, regardless of their zip code. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we're going to go ahead then and, and open it up to any questions or discussions. Members, is there any discussion on Senate File 4492 or questions for the lead author of the agency? Yes. Um, go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my guess this would be for uh, Assistant Commissioner. Um, I have a question. When we say elevated nitrate levels, do you, what, is a, what is that number? What is an elevated nitrate level? Assistant Commissioner. Madam Chair, Senator Wiesenberg, uh, this particular bill relates to level two drinking water supply management areas, and I think the Department of Agriculture defines a level two drinking water supply management area as one where the groundwater, the nitrate within the groundwater is eight milligrams per liter or higher. Senator Wiesenberg. Th thank you, Madam Chair. So that would be two below the 10 per milliliter that is statewide, is that what you're saying? Assistant Commissioner. Madam Chair, Senator Wiesenberg, yes. I think these questions might be more appropriate for the Department of Ag, but I think that I can generally answer where you're going. The state water quality standard for um, protection of drinking water for nitrate is 10 milligrams per liter. The Department of Agriculture sets that level two standard at eight milligrams per liter because what they're trying to do is work to reduce nitrates within the groundwater in those areas before the groundwater actually surpasses the 10 milligram per liter standard. Senator yeah. Wiesenberg, follow uh, up? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, I, I think that we should work to not increase anything in our water. I think that's good. Um, but I know I had shared a, I had shared a study with, uh, I think I shared it with Senator Herr and Senator Putnam about nitrates. Um, and this is a study that was done 
you know, with over a million pregnant females in Denmark. So they, they tested the nitrates in water and from zero to 25, they, they looked at birth defects in, in babies after they were born. And from zero to 25 parts per million, there was statistically no increase in birth defects. So now we're saying we have to be at eight, but even in the most vulner vulnerable person, a, a baby in the womb, it says even up to 25 parts per million is something that doesn't harm them. I'm not saying we should try to put more nitrates in water. I'm just saying that at what point do we say, you know, we're at eight? Well, what science is there? Where's the science? Show me, show me the studies that say eight is the number we should be at. That's what we need to see. Um, when I'm looking at, you know, a study done by doctors that show that zero to 25 is basically safe, or is, is not, and not safe, is, is the same, you know, zero to 25 is the same for, for an in, uh, infant or a, a, a fetus. So now when we're born, you could even have more nitrates in your water. Again, I'm not saying we should have nitrates in water, but at some point we can't get to zero. Um, people need to be able to continue to farm. We need to be able to eat food. Um, farmers don't want to spread too much manure on their fields. So we, there's, a, there's a line that we shouldn't cross. And if we have to say, you can't get above eight when this study shows that there's statistically no chance of anyone being hurt by that amount of nitrates in water. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Assistant Commissioner, if there's any response you'd like to give or, or chair her. Um, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Wiesenberg, I, I'm not sure that there was a question in there for us, but I do think your question seems related to the health risks associated with a 10 milligram per liter nitrate water quality standard, and that's probably an area that's more appropriate for the Department of Health to respond to. Okay, thank you. I bet we can find some, some science and send it your way, Senator Wiesenberg. Appreciate the ask um, and discussion. Um, anybody else, anybody have any questions or comments in regard to this Senate file? Okay, um, before we, uh, we're, we plan to lay this bill over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill, are there any um, final comments you would like to add, Senator Herr? No, I, I appreciate the hearing and the discussion of, of this bill, mainly uh, to help the two agency um, manage uh, better and also synchronize in their work uh, to work on sensitive, sensitive areas of our state regarding nitrate. So ask for your support and ask for uh, the uh, layover of this uh, bill to, to our omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator Herr. And with that, Senate File 4492 is laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Senator Herr, would you like to proceed to 4493 next? Or would you like to... Uh, 4433. 4433. 4433. Got it. All right. So next we will hear Senate File 4433, uh, which is brought to us by Senator Herr. Senator Herr, to your bill. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Senate File 4433, uh, this is an MPCA proposal related to enforcement and emergency power. The Senate File 4433 clarifies certain authorities in extreme cases where swift action is needed to protect the environment and residents of Minnesota from significant harm. Uh, late last year, a group of senators met with the MPCA regarding several high-profile enforcement cases and asked the agency what barrier exists and what tools are needed and how the legislator can help. This proposal worked to remove those barriers and provide those tools so the agency can adequately protect Minnesotans. I'll hand over to Director John, Tom Johnson to walk us through the bill. Very good, welcome to the committee. Uh, if you'd please introduce yourself formally for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, uh, Tom Johnson, I'm the Director of Government Affairs for uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And just wanna Thank uh, Chair Her for, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, this is an MPCA policy bill. Uh, we have had versions of this bill introduced over the years, uh, most notably uh, in 2021 or and 2020, uh, when there were was a high profile 
enforcement case in, of a facility in the White Bear area. And that's the, that's the type of situation the agency is trying to address. Very significant issues, willful noncompliance, issues like uh, falsification of records or evidence of, of endangerment or potential environmental harm. As, the, uh, as Chair Hur stated, the agency met with a group of senators uh, this last uh, fall regarding past and present enforcement cases of concern. And the, the senators asked the agency to identify what tools the agency needs uh, to ensure that we're protecting um, our communities across Minnesota. And so this is that bill. Uh, I'll repeat that this is looking for tools that help us address very rare and extreme cases. The MPCA is more than willing to work with the author, members of the committee, any stakeholders interested in the bill as it moves through the process. And I'm happy to uh, either walk through areas of the bill or Madam Chair, if you'd like Senate Council to do that or uh, whatever your preference is. Um, I think just a, a brief uh, walkthrough uh, would be great. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, there are several sections of the bill. The, the first section uh, on 2.1, the first change is just to clarify that, that the agency can reopen um, some of these permits, variances, standards, rules, uh, essentially the, the regulatory work that we do on a regular basis. And this is in 115, so related uh, mostly to uh, prevent, control, or, or abate water pollution. As we move over uh, to uh, page 4, 4.15, this section, and you'll see it again uh, over in, in 116.071, our other main enforcement statutes, this is uh, allowing the agency to recover costs for situations where we have to, uh, where there's already been an agreement made with, a, with a, a, a regulated party to settle an enforcement issue, and we have to go above and beyond that agreement and ensure compliance. And so the agency in that case is uh, uh, spending additional money up to $25,000. If we hit that threshold, the agency would be able to recover those costs. And these do not include legal costs, but other costs related to ensuring compliance in those, in those situations. Uh, moving over to uh, page six, 6.13, this section two here. Um, this is, we already have the uh, authority to compel performance. This is clarifying that we could also cease performance in these situations, uh, again, when we're, uh, when we're inf enforcing these, um, the, the, these are the remedies available to us when enforcing under this section. There is a, uh, a piece on injunctions where, again, we are uh, clarifying that the, the agency does, in fact, have the ability to cease operation or activities until such time as the commissioner has reasonable assurance that renewed operation or activities will not violate pollution requirements or cause harm to human health. The section four on, uh, starting on line 6.25 is regarding stipulation agreements. There already exists the ability to, uh, for a, a party to a stipulation agreement to request an extension what we're clarifying here is that uh, if the assertion is based solely on the increased cost of complying with the stipulation agreement, that we may deny that request. Uh, on seven, page seven, compliance when permit not obtained, uh, you'll see this. Really, we want to ensure that uh, there's not a, there's not an incentive to not obtain a permit. So companies that are obtaining permits have certain regulations and limits and uh, requirements in those permits. And if, a, if there's a decision made by a, an entity to not obtain a permit, that they would still be subject to the same types of requirements that they would have if they were to have gotten that permit. So, or if they were to have obtained the permit. So just evening that out. Uh, at the 
once you hit section six here, you'll see some of the same uh, pieces that were in 115, reopening permits, clarifying that piece on line 7.14. 7.28, uh, again, this is the language regarding uh, agency, recovering agency oversight costs uh, when uh, ensuring compliance of a negotiated agreement. We have the stipulation agreement, again, on, on page eight, uh, this stipulation agreement language uh, allowing the agency to deny an extension based on increased cost, the compliance when permits not obtained, the final section, Madam Chair, is uh, related to our emergency powers. Uh, in this section, um, the agency is adding uh, other acts of concern, and this is then on page nine, where in extreme cases, again, I mentioned these a little bit earlier, falsification of records, a history of noncompliance, uh, and this would be with uh, the, with schedules of compliance or terms of a stipulation agreement that a regulated party has already agreed to in an enforcement case, chronic or substantial permit violations, or operating with or without a permit where there is this evidence of danger uh, to the health or welfare of the people or this environmental harm. In those uh, rare instances, uh, there would be these additional authorities where uh, the commissioner could suspend or revoke a permit, issue an order to cease operation activities, require financial assurances, reopen and modify a permit, uh, require additional agency oversight, or pursue other actions deemed necessary, again, focused on abating pollution and protecting human health. With that, Madam Chair, happy to answer questions. I also have other staff here at the agency with me. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next on our list of testifiers, we also have uh, Tony Quillis with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Tony Quillis. I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And I just want to... Um, come at Senate file 4433 from the perspective of a, a permit holder, because this affects all permits statewide, whether you've got, you're a city, a county, or a business. And there's a couple things I'd like to point out to you that are concerning for any of those folks that have a permit uh, in the state from the Pollution Control Agency. Mr. Johnson referenced on 4.15 to 4.24, a negotiated agreement between parties. Well, if there's a dispute between the parties, Madam Chair, the concern is that there would be essentially an open checkbook for the agency with no chance for, if there was a dispute between the agency and the permittee, to, for them to appeal those inspections, sampling, monitoring, and modeling, there's going and it's going to be a substantial cost because it's definitely over twenty-five thousand dollars. And the concern is is that folks will not go into these negotiated agreements and will go to litigation, which will add time costs and uncertainty to all parties involved, and also add legal costs to both the state agency as well as the project proposer or the permittee. Sections two and three that we talked about with the ability of the agency to cease operations uh, in both section two and three, Madam Chair, I think are both covered in section nine. If you look at section nine under the emergency power of the agency, they have imminent and substantial, they have, if there is imminent and substantial danger to the health and welfare of the people of the state or any of them as a result of the pollution of air, land, and water, the commissioner by emergency order may immediately discontinue, abate the pollution without notice, without hearing of a project or of a permittee. Those are some pretty broad, expansive powers, and I'm not quite sure why they need to go back and clarify the cease operation or the cease performance in sections two and three. And Madam Chair, the final point on section nine is the uh, new subdivision two is got some um, language in there, the history of compliance and the chronic and substantial permit violations. 
Madam Chair and members, I think that needs some further clarification. They're pretty broad. Um, history of noncompliance, could that be a clerical or paper uh, violation? Could that be an emission violation? There, it's, it, like I said, there's some broad terms, chronic and substantial. What, how those need to be defined and clarified, I think I'd like to work with the agency on those. And those are really important, Madam Chair, because if you look down to section B, it allows the agency, if any of those um, four above it, items before dealing with noncompliance, chronic or substantial, are triggered, they can come in and suspend, revoke a permit, uh, cease operation even without the presence of imminent or substantial danger. So something as simple, the way this tracks back to me, Ms. Madam Chair, is if there's a clerical or paper uh, violation, so that clarifies as a history of noncompliance, the agency, no, even though there's no threat of imminent or substantial danger, can come in and suspend the operations of a facility in the state. And so, Madam Chair, thank you for the ability to make those comments on this, and there are some concerns there, and I'll stick around for any questions. But thank you, Madam Chair, for the ability to comment. Thank you for your testimony. Those are the only testifiers that we had listed um, for this bill. Um, Senator Herr, is there anything you'd like to add before we move to discussion? Um, no, no, ma ma Madam Chair, uh, this... Um, I just had a little tidbit that this bill will be uh, moved to judiciary, and so there will be room and time if to have discussion with Mr. Kellis and the MPCA as well. Okay. Very good. Um, if I might, I have a question about, um, well, I would like to move to discussion, <laughs> but I'll start us off with, I have a question about... Um, one of the comments made by Mr. Quillis, um, and this is perhaps for the MPCA, could you just walk us through, so I hear the concern that, that, that these changes would give the MPCA the ability to um, stop, um, uh, to stop work to stop the pollution, so if that meant stopping work to issue an injunction to, to in, intervene to stop some actions. Um, and the allegation, at least, the, or the interpretation brought to us in the testimony is that that would be without notice. Um, can you describe to us the procedure and the process that, M, that the MPCA has to follow if it, if it does um, use these powers, and are they? Is it laid out in a different part of statute? Can you just give us a little bit of background on that? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I may also call up uh, our industrial division director uh, to help with maybe the second part of that question. But uh, the the section that I think uh, Mr. Quillis was pointing to here in the emergency powers, where there is no notice, um, that would require the agency to prove. Uh, imminent and substantial danger, which is a very, very high bar. So the the at the no notice part of this uh, would only apply to the uh, the emergency powers section that already exists in our authority, and it is a very high bar to prove. In fact, the reasons why you see cease performance added in in various parts of this uh, of this bill is because in in previous situations where we have attempted to uh, exercise those authorities. Uh, we, even if we've been successful in, in uh, ceasing performance for a very temporary period, the court has ordered us then to allow performance to continue even when we believe there's a, still an imminent and substantial danger. So I think we're looking to clarify the, the areas where we're able to cease performance uh, outside of proving um, an imminent and substantial danger, which is a very, very high bar to prove. And there could be areas where there is still a risk to uh, a community, risk to human health or the environment, where we would want to cease performance until it's proven that uh, a facility's pollution has been abated. Thank you. And if I could ask a clarifying question, if, and if there is an expert from MPCA who has additional information that could be helpful. So the process would follow, and, and this did come up, I think, um, or questions on this subject recently came um, 
from some quarters around the foundry issue in Minneapolis, wondering um, uh, what the MPCA's powers were, how fast it acted, whether it acted <laughs> inappropriately or according to the dictates that it needs to act with. Um, so in the event that there was an allegation or uh, a suspicion that there was an emergency happening, that there was a real danger to the public from uh, pollution, what is the process that the MPCA could issue an emergency order just from the MPCA and then it receives judicial review within a certain amount of time? Can you just lay out, I'm, I'm looking for like a, um, a little bit of context around timeline, just so we understand what we're talking about. Are we talking about something that hap would happen over months and what kind of review, how quickly would the review happen? So just some details around that, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if you'd introduce yourself, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Madam Chair, my name is Courtney Allers Nelson, and I'm the Director of the Industrial Division at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Thank you. Um, to your question, just generally about process, uh, it would not come out of the blue, so to speak, for a regulated party to uh, know that we were looking at them or that we had concerns. Uh, we have a very, um, as robust an inspection or presence, compliance presence as we possibly can with various industries across the, across the state. Um, but when a community is concerned or uh, we are aware of um, certain issues, we of course would, you know, investigate through an inspection process, uh, perhaps re request records in advance. We'd be in communication largely with the facility. Um, we do do unannounced inspections. Um, of course, uh, it's not like uh, we're there alone. The people uh, who operate the facility would be much aware of what we were looking at at the time. So the gathering of the information requires quite a bit of communication with the regulated party. And if there is uh, a clear imminent threat to human health, that would also have to be a clear violation and something in terms of um, the imminent health threat, something that we could measure. We want to be able to be sure before we take action, uh, both to protect the community but also to uh, in consideration of the regulated party. So I would say um, folks are very well aware and in communication along the way. In terms of a timeline, exercising emergency powers is an extremely rare and as um, Director Johnson has said, a high bar for us to achieve. And so we would likely engage in another form of enforcement action um, to initiate uh, the process. Perhaps it's an administrative order um, that the agency can work, uh, can initiate to stop an action. And we would go from there. So it would be a form of escalation. It's not um, something we would, using our emergency powers is not something that we would go to first. Thank you for that answer. And then if, if so just in quick answer to part of my question is, does the MPCA act alone in, um, exercising these emergency powers and what kind of review then does that order receive? Madam Chair, that is a difficult answer. I have a, that's a difficult thing for me to talk about because we have very rarely actually engaged in this. Um, this would take incredible review inside the agency and perhaps consultation with the um, Attorney General's office. So there would be, uh, again, it's a very high bar, something we've rarely done, and um, the review and scrutiny inside and outside the agency would have to take place. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And, and I look forward to just, just my own, some more conversation about how that might work out. And I know that there have been concerns in various quarters about whether or not the MPCA has the powers that it needs um, to be able to protect people. So um, thank you for the answers and I look forward to some work on that. Um, members, any discussion and further questions? Yes, Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple questions. The one, you know, according to the testimony, uh, you don't ever use this. And, and if you needed to use it, you could use it now. So I'm wondering, you know, you, you explained that you might need a little more authority here, but it's, it sounds like you don't. And, and so it's, it's curious to me why you uh, brought this forward. But on, 
on page two on line one where you have the authority now to reopen uh, your uh, investigations or whatever you call them uh, is there ever is there ever a time when after the after the permit is issued that uh, that the permittee can have peace in knowing that he's safe even for a little while from being shut down or, or uh, dra dragged through court uh, I'll Whoever would like to, to take Johnson, that question, up to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Senator Green. Uh, yes, I, you know, in this one section, it would only be in order to prevent, control, or abate water pollution. Uh, so, to the extent that the permittee is uh, preventing, controlling, and abating water pollution, they could rest assured. Senator Green, follow up. Well, thank you, uh, but you already have that authority. Do you not? I mean, if you go into a building to inspect it and and you see a violation, you can you can stop it right now, can you not? Um, to Madam, the senator's question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Senator Green. Uh, this is specific to the reopen piece of it. There are other uh, authorities that are in this uh, clause here that that we could do, including um, some of these other pieces, but. This is specific to reopen, and that is not clear in the statute currently. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. So if you if looking down through the rest of the bill, even down on, uh, on the next page, so you actually could reopen a, reopen a, a permit and then uh, basically force people into litigation, except for you can't force them into litigation because if it begins to cost them over $25,000, then they have to pay all your costs. Is that correct? Madam Chair. Mr. Johnson, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. In, in this uh, section where we're uh, asking for reimbursement of costs, we're very careful to say the agency's legal and litigation costs on, on 4.21 and 4.22, the agency's legal and litigation costs are not covered by this clause. So we, we would ensure that, that legal pieces of that are not covered. This is purely for ensuring compliance with an agreement that's already been made with uh, the responsible party. Senator Green, any follow-up? Yeah, I do. It says, uh, excuse me, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. the agency may recover oversight costs exceeding $25,000. So oversight is not litigation, but uh, that's, that's a pretty steep, um, a pretty steep fine, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. And, uh, and you're recouping what you're requiring them to do. Um, I wish, I honestly wish that we had that in every aspect of the state, except for agencies, where if someone uh, was, uh, was forced to do something or, uh, or even litigated, you know, uh, had been sued, that if they, uh, if they won that case, that uh, they wouldn't have to pay. So my question is, uh, suppose you, you do this, and they go into litigation, uh, and they win. Do they still get charged twenty five thousand dollars, Mr. Johnson? Madam Chair, thank you. So, there are there are also, to my understanding, and and I am not an attorney, but my understanding is that the agency could already be uh, that a, that a party <coughs> to the lawsuit could already uh, ask for their legal costs from the agency if they were to win the law, a lawsuit in certain cases. So there, there are those remedies available, to my understanding, already for uh, the, the party bringing a lawsuit against the agency. Uh, in our case, uh, <coughs> this would purely be for situations where we are uh, doing additional inspection, sampling, monitoring, modeling, risk assessment, you know, permitting, engineering review, economic analysis and review, th these are all uh, in service of ensuring compliance with an agreement that is already negotiated and final. Senator Green, any follow-up? Oh. Okay. Members, any further discussion or any questions for the author or our experts? Okay. Seeing none. <coughs> Senator Herr, uh, would you like to move that Senate file 4433 um, and is, has it been 
Did we receive an amendment on this? No. Not, not that I know of. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Okay, Senator Hur, would you like to move your bill uh, be recommended to pass and re referred to the Senate Judiciary Committee? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, on Senator Hur's motion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. The motion passes. Thank you, Senator Hur. Yeah. Ma ma Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Hur. Uh, I still have two bills, but um, looks like right, our time right now is uh, 457. And we have to do a uh, hard stop at five, and so I will not have enough time for the two bill. So um, I will, and that will be the following bill too. There's three bills on our agenda, so I like to, um, you know, uh, leave this bill as it, the two bill as it is, and we can uh, find a different date to uh, hear the two bill, my two bill, and then the other bill, Senator Morrison's bill as well. So. Uh, I like to go ahead adjourn. and adjourn. Yep. Yep. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much, Senator Herr, and uh, thank you everybody for the testimony and for the good discussion today. The Senate Environment Committee is adjourned.